On today's walk, I'd like to answer a question that I get quite a bit, especially from adult men, uh, and one that I think is uh, surrounded with a lot of mystery and confusion that, that can easily be cleared away, and that's how we ought to study the Summa Theologica. How we ought to study the Summa Theologica. Now, the reason why this question arises is because the modern university and seminary culture, it has to work very hard to preserve the appearance of its control to learning. The modern schools and colleges and universities are living in a strange transitional state right now where their, their necessity and importance is only psychological. It no longer actually exists in reality. The schools and colleges and universities are no longer necessary. The buildings, the faculty, the tuition, all of these things are obsolete because the access to all of the Necessary study materials and resources are freely accessible everywhere. Fifty years ago, things were totally different. Fifty years ago, if you wanted to access a copy of the Summa Theologica, you either had to buy a copy, which, would, which could cost you a hundred dollars or more, or you had to go to a library that actually kept copies of the Summa Theologica on hand. For example, a university or a seminary library. <clears throat> In order to study the Summa Theologica, you didn't need to actually be in a college course and get college credits for it, but most of the resources that you would need to study these subjects were kept in universities that were only accessible to students. For example, when I was at Rutgers University in the 1990s, in the basement there were just rows and rows of old textbooks, textbooks from the 1400s, 1500s, 1600s, 1700s, through early American history, and I spent years down there working through those old textbooks, studying the history of classical education and education in England and the United States, and while I was there, those books were slowly being scanned as the internet technology and equipment developed. By the time I was finished with my studies and getting into teaching, digital copies of those books, not just from Rutgers University, but from all universities, were being made available through a number of different research databases, which, again, either required the payment of an expensive subscription fee or were accessible to students enrolled in universities who could log into these systems through their university libraries. But by my third, fourth, fifth year of teaching, services like Google Books and Archive.org and Project Gutenberg started to develop, and all of a sudden, 
thousands and thousands, even maybe millions of old texts were accessible from my living room on the, on the internet. And so this dependence on the universities and their physical collection of books and resources became less and less necessary for those who wished to access those works and study them. And now these things are easily accessible. And that dependence on the university and on being an enrolled student or an alumnus is no longer necessary. The treasures that were formerly kept in the university or in the seminary are now publicly accessible. However, the universities and seminaries, because their entire business, as it were, was built on the control of access to these resources, continue to operate as if nothing has changed. And this is what these modern academic institutions do, because they've become a massive business system, and they provide careers and income to armies of people. These people are supposed to be promoting learning and helping people to become wiser and more intelligent. And yet, the reality is, the information technology and communications technology that has developed has made them unnecessary. And now, to preserve their business and income... They have to continue to pretend that the old system remains in place and that we need to continue to go to them to learn things which they no longer control access to. And as I said, the value of these institutions is just psychological at this point. It's no longer real. And yet, for people who don't, who don't understand this or who have other motives in seeking these studies, like they want to get jobs themselves and they, they aspire to actually be the next generation of these college professors or librarians and so on, they aspire to these paid positions and to the, to the way of life that has become associated with these positions And so they seek these studies and these symbols of learning, not for the actual goal, which is the study, in this case, of the Summa Theologica, but they're seeking something else. It's like when Jesus says to the Pharisees, you pray in public that you may be seen by men and you have your reward. When we pursue something for the wrong reasons, we create the problems that arise, and those problems are artificial. If one says that he desires to study Greek or Latin or Hebrew, philosophy, theology, and so on, in 2021, he has absolutely no need to go to a college or a school or a university or a seminary in order to study and learn and master any of those subjects. And so when people talk about this dilemma of how they can study, there's usually some underlying ulterior motive that maybe they're not willing to talk about but exists and is the actual cause of their pretended confusion and uncertainty about how to study. What they're really asking is not, how can I study the Summa Theologica? They're asking, how can I get some kind of temporal, material credit or reward 
for the study of the Summa Theologica? And the answer to that question is very simple. Go pay tuition at a university or a seminary. If what you want is the if you what you want is the diploma or the certificate or the degree or the credits, if that's what you're looking for, something that you can get your hands on and maybe turn into some money in the future, then yeah, you've got to go spend money to make money. You've got to go plant your seed in hope of getting new fruit. That's business you're talking about, though. That's not study. If you want business, then you need to go play the business game. Especially if you want it the easy way, where you're looking to go and obtain a degree or a certificate that you can then use as a ticket for available jobs. The creation of which is someone else's responsibility. If that's what you're interested in, then you shouldn't phrase your question as, how can I study the Summa Theologica? You should phrase the question honestly and say, how can I gain some kind of temporal reward through the study of the Summa Theologica? And that's where your complex question leads you to that dilemma of how in the world, or why in the world, a person would spend hundreds and hundreds of dollars to access knowledge that's available freely to him on a computer in his bedroom. There's no explanation for why anyone would do that if he was seeking the true immaterial benefit of scientific knowledge which dwells in the soul through study and meditation. There's no problem finding that, obtaining that. It's just a matter of effort and time. But usually the question is more complex and less noble than it's presented. So if you're interested in gaining some temporal reward for some minimal course of required studies, you need to go pay university tuition and get what you want. There's no cheap or easy way to do that. But what I would say is, I have no idea why you're doing that. The knowledge is available to you freely in your own hand. And I think you should consider whether there's a better course to pursue than the old obsolete course that's going to die through the next generation. For example, look at this COVID crisis and how classes were canceled and moved online. The universities moved the classes online. Students lost all of the benefits of being on campus, being in class with classmates, being present in the environment of the classroom. And yet the universities charge the students the same tuition even though the students were studying in Zoom meetings, the tuition stayed the same and the suckers paid for it because what they're after, the university understands what you're after is your credits and your degrees and you're willing to pay the same amount of money even if we take away the classroom experience and stick you in a Zoom meeting Because that's not actually what you're paying for. And they can continue to dangle the degree and the credits in front of the faces of the students and they'll accept any cost for them. 
especially when government subsidized loans are available to pay for it all. It's a beautiful system for those profiting off of it, but it's a dead system that in the next generation is going to crash and burn. So it's time to look forward to the future and consider what you should do instead of continuing in this dead course of obsolete school, college, university studies chasing after useless pieces of paper that are no longer going to have any value in society. I heard a statistic yesterday that there are over 4,400 colleges in the United States. Over 4,400 colleges in the United States. Obviously, That's not required by any learning or academic goals. That's business. That's business. These colleges are massive businesses that provide incredible sources of wealth for administrators, relatively easy income for tenured professors, and it's a system that's just kept going that actually, instead of taking ignorant students and making them wise, exploits the ignorance of the students, capitalizes on their worldly anxieties, and sends them off into the world in a condition that all of the statistics and evidence shows is terrible. The students leave in debt. They leave with degrees and diplomas that are not worth the debt that pays for them. And now we have, as the consequence of this, we have this idea of debt forgiveness gaining momentum as a policy of what we would call the liberal political party, and you can see that this debt crisis is actually going to lead people to vote for a party that promotes all kinds of reckless moral principles, and yet these Catholic college administrators, professors, and school administrators in general will pretend to be opposed to that party while their conduct and their institutions, by selfishly and with short-sighted thinking, take advantage of the available student loans and government resources available to colleges, create the crisis and contribute to the crisis that's going to lead to an undesired political solution. And when that day comes, they'll all be crying about it and saying how we need to resist the liberals and resist the democratic desire to cancel student debt. But what they won't admit is that they are actually the cause of that crisis. And so they'll say one thing while they do another. Now, let's move away from all of that because at this point you'll either be persuaded of what I say or you're just stubbornly committed to it and there's nothing else to say. If it's actual knowledge of Catholic theology that you're interested in, it's very conveniently available and, as I said, requires nothing more than that you invest the time and effort necessary to study it. The the text of the Summa Theologica is available to you 
freely online. Of course, St. Thomas wrote in Latin. So you might think that you have this obstacle of fluency in Latin to overcome in order to study the Summa Theologica. But there's no such obstacle because the Dominican Fathers have translated the entire Summa Theologica into English for you. And their translation is freely available online for you to study. You can study the entire Summa Theologica in English translation from a reliable source. As I said, the Dominicans provided us with the English translation that's available. That translation is available to you online for free. You can access it even on the Classical Liberal Arts Academy website in the library, where we have links to the digital copies of the entire Summa Theologica in English translation. So language is not an obstacle. Cost is not an obstacle. You don't need to go anywhere. It's available to you right where you are at no cost in English translation. So there's no excuse. No excuse to not study and master the Summa Theologica. Now, if you actually are sincere in your desire to obtain the knowledge of scholastic theology through the study of the Summa Theologica, it's just a matter of effort and time. It's a very great work. It's going to take consistent study over an extended period of time. If you're not willing to invest the necessary effort and time, then you have no reasonable reason to expect to possess the benefit of that knowledge. So you're going to have to sacrifice other things, other activities, maybe your sleep and so on. And you're going to have to invest your time and your effort in the study of the Summa Theologica. Now, if the question is, how should I study the Summa Theologica? The answer is very simple. You should start at the beginning and you should study through to the end. There is nothing magical about the Summa Theologica. There is nothing difficult about the Summa Theologica. St. Thomas, in his preface to it, even says it's intended for beginners. You don't need a theology degree to understand the Summa Theologica. You don't need to be ordained to the priesthood or be a member of a religious community to understand the Summa Theologica. It's a very simple, orderly work presented to us to teach us, in a certain way, all of scholastic theology. The obstacle that stands between you and the knowledge of the Summa Theologica is time and effort. That's it. Now, if you want to get into the practical specifics of how you should go about studying the Summa Theologica. As I said, there's no magic plan. You start at the beginning. And the reason why I say start at the beginning is because the whole purpose of the Summa Theologica, just like the purpose of Euclid's elements in geometry, is to construct a science that's derived from principles that are certain and by the art of reason lead us to necessary conclusions that are equally certain. Let me repeat that. 
The purpose of the Summa Theologica is to construct a science of theology that begins with principles that are certain and leads by reasoning to conclusions which are equally certain. That's what science means in the ancient sense. It means a systematic knowledge of some subject that is certain. So keep those three words together. Science, systematic, and certain. Easy to remember. The Summa Theologica is not an encyclopedia. St. Thomas isn't merely writing brief articles on a thousand and one different theological topics. However, after it's been studied and its true science has been learned, it can certainly be used as a reference work, and that's one of its greatest values long term. But to study and understand the Summa Theologica, you have to understand something about ancient philosophy and how it differs from modern scholarship. Because if you miss this, you miss the whole point of the Summa Theologica, and you'll be prone to the kind of errors that people in modern circles, modern scholars, easily fall into, by which they demonstrate their own ignorance and lack of real study. As I said, the Summa Theologica is an investigation of the subject of divine revelation. That's the purpose of the Summa Theologica. It's an investigation of the subject of divine revelation. We could say it's a study of God himself. But it's a study, and I like to, I like to use the word investigation, It's an investigation of a subject that makes use of a particular method of investigation. And that method of investigation is the demonstrative method established by Aristotle. We could call it the Aristotelian method. We could call it a demonstrative method. We could call it a scholastic method. But what it's not is a modern academic method. And we have to understand the difference so that we can study the Summa Theologica rightly, appreciate what it actually offers us, and then gain the benefit that it offers us by studying it and understanding it and using it rightly. To explain this, I'd like to go back to the example that I gave, which is Euclid's elements of geometry. Geometry is one of the four divisions of quantity, one of the four arts of the quadrivium. In geometry, we seek to investigate a certain subject. The subject we wish to investigate in geometry is magnitude at rest. And the question then is, how do we conduct an investigation that leads us to systematic and certain knowledge of a subject? How do we conduct this investigation so that we can obtain science, that is, systematic and certain knowledge of the subject? The answer to that question is by demonstration, by reasoning. And reasoning doesn't just mean making arguments for things. Reasoning and the art of reasoning and the demonstrative method that was the the greatest achievement of the work of Aristotle 
And the reason why he was able to make such great progress in philosophy, the method that we're talking about is one that begins and ends and makes sure that every step taken is a certain step. Every step offers absolute certainty. We make progress by stepping, as it were, on solid rock, not on sand, not on floating boards, not on loose, slippery rocks, but on solid stone. That's the goal of philosophy. In order to do this, there is a natural progression that we follow in our studies. And I talked about this yesterday in our study of ancient mathematics. The natural progression, which Aristotle explains, is from universals to particulars. From universals to particulars. Another way to express that is from wholes to parts. Another way to express that is from sensible things to insensible things. This is the natural progression of learning. This is how we obtain science. Another way Aristotle describes this is we pursue the knowledge of things that are known to us to the knowledge of things that are known to nature or to God. We move from appearances of what is true to our own senses to realities of what is true according to the true nature of things. We seek to move from knowledge as man thinks to knowledge as God thinks. And as we progress in that movement from seeing as man sees to seeing as God sees, that's what it means to become wise. And there's a natural progression that we're to follow in pursuit of this kind of knowledge. That progression is the art of demonstrative reasoning and investigation, Aristotelian method of investigation, and we see a good example of it in Euclid's Elements of Geometry, with which many are to some degree familiar, which is why I'll use it as an example. In Euclid's Geometry, we want to understand systematically and certainly the science of magnitudes at rest, or of geometric bodies, three-dimensional and two-dimensional objects. We can start by just saying things at random. We could, we could, take a, we could list a bunch of different shapes or figures, for example, and we could start listing characteristics that are observable in those different figures, but you can see what we're doing. Our knowledge of the subject is chaotic, random, and based entirely on how things appear to us. Our knowledge is not systematic, it's not certain, and we're not seeing things as they're known according to nature, but we're seeing them as they're known according to us or to human observation. Euclid, making use of the Aristotelian method, begins where? He doesn't begin talking about the properties of figures. He doesn't even allow us to assume anything to be true unless it's demonstrated to be true. And this if you learn anything from this talk, this is the difference between modern academics and scholars 
and philosophers or wise men. The difference, if you talk to a scholar, a quote-unquote scholar or academic today, or you talk to a person who is confident because they went to a, a college and got a degree in a certain subject that they are experts in that subject, if you enter into a discussion with them, you will find that every discussion consists of floods of information, arrogant assertions with no evidence, arrogant confidence in their certifications and degrees as the evidence that what they say is true. And you will not find proofs of every assertion that's made. You will not find scholars willing or able to provide proof for the individual assertions that they make. They assert things that they were taught in college and which were necessary for the reception of their credits and degrees and certificates. And they will copy and paste those assertions and repeat what they were taught in their colleges and, and seminaries. They will repeat it, having never had that assertion proven to be true. And they will just string together pages and pages of assertions and assumptions and statements, historical statements, um, assumptions about what people say by, by pulling quotes out with no context, quotes that are not demonstrated to have the meaning that they suggest they have, historical facts for which no one can have any certainty, and they will simply try to overwhelm readers or debaters with an arrogant spirit of authority that's all based on an artificial certificate or diploma. They're not interested in reasoning. They're not interested in proving that what they say or assume is true. They simply wish to force people into line. And they threaten them with scoffing, disrespectful speech, personal criticism, and so on, as if questioning the degrees and diplomas and institutions is some kind of ignorance. The key to pulling the mask off of this fake learning is to constantly ask for every assertion to be proven. So, for example, if someone argues with me and makes an assertion and I ask for evidence that demonstrates the truth of the assertion they just made, I will almost always find that the discussion ends and they attack me personally, scoffing, ridiculing, mocking, as if the truth is so obvious that it requires no proof. The reality is that they have no proof. Or what some will do is they will post a link to a YouTube video or a link to a book, as if I'm supposed to go and search for the proofs for the assertions that they've made in a discussion as if the audience is responsible to prove the assertions made by the speaker, rather than as every writing course teaches that you will ever take, the speaker is responsible to provide the proof for assertions he makes. The audience is not responsible to prove the assertions that a speaker makes. The speaker is responsible to provide the proof for assertions he makes. That's taught from day one in any writing or speaking class that anyone ever takes in school until one becomes a quote-unquote scholar, and then he actually, in his daily practice, does the opposite and just makes assertions 
ridicules those who question them, offers no proof for the things that he has been taught to go and repeat because that he has no proof, and then simply make fun of and ridicule and dismiss himself from the discussions that he has entered, hoping that he would just bulldoze everyone with his degrees and academic credentials. But what we see in the modern scholar, in the modern academic, is an, an inability to actually prove the content of his teaching, to prove his assertions. And what we will also find, not only is there no certainty in his teaching or in his opinions, there's no system in his opinions. The academic system of the modern age depends on the, on the inaccessibility of any curriculum or system. The professor is free to make up his own syllabus for every course. No one ever knows what the curriculum is. No one ever knows what the syllabus is. The professor creates his own standards for what's considered mastery. He makes the tests for his own course. He assigns the grades for his own assignments. It's a, it's a subjective system that has nothing to do with the quality and certainty of ancient philosophy. Now, getting back to Euclid. Euclid says, all right, we want to investigate the subject of magnitudes at rest, the art of geometry. So, where should we begin? We should begin by establishing a list of truths which are universal and are absolutely certain. And so this list consists of what we call the axioms. The axioms are self-evident truths that all men can acknowledge without requiring any demonstration. For example, a simple statement like, a whole is equal to the sum of all of its parts. We could look at a crowd of people and say, is there anyone who objects to this assertion? A whole is equal to the sum of all of its parts. And everyone will consent. And we can say, great, that's one point that we can start with. Okay, here's another point. Here's another self-evident truth that applies to the, to the investigation of quantity. We could say, okay, if we have two quantities, two different quantities, and we find, and we can demonstrate that each of these quantities is equal to the same third quantity. So quantity number one is equal to quantity number three, and quantity number two is equal to quantity number three. Then quantity one is equal to quantity two. Does everyone agree with this? Does everyone see that this is true without any demonstration? And every human being would say, yes, that's a self-evident truth that needs no demonstration. Great. So we can be absolutely certain that this is true. Now, once we've collected all of the self-evident truths that relate to the subject which we'd like to investigate, we can begin to reason from these self-evident truths. And we'll find that as we begin joining these self-evident truths together, some other truths will necessarily arise from them. And this is the art of reasoning. And this is the means and the method by which the truth is investigated, by this uh, demonstrative method. From self-evident truths that are absolutely certain and require no proof, which, when combined 
through the art of reasoning or through the act of reasoning, lead necessarily to some new assertions that are just as certain as the original propositions. Now, in addition to axioms, Euclid adds two other kinds of principles. The second kind of principle he adds, or element, that's why the book is called The Elements, the second kind of element he adds are definitions. Now, definitions are not natural. And what that means is that definitions don't exist naturally in the world. Human beings, as Aristotle explains, by convention or by agreement, establish the definitions of words. Words are themselves signs of ideas. Men have to agree that the words that they use are signs of particular ideas. This is the purpose of a dictionary, to make sure that if I use a certain word, everyone that I'm speaking to knows exactly the idea that's signified by that word. And we all agree that every time we use that word, we're going to use it in an, a clearly understood sense so that there can be no confusion caused by the changing of the meanings of the words that we're using. In the very first chapter of Aristotle's work on logic, in the book of the Categories, he explains the difference between homonymous terms, synonymous terms, and paronymous terms. When Aristotle sets out to teach the art of reasoning, the very first topic he addresses is the right use of words. He explains that homonymous terms are words that are used where the word is the same in two different statements, but the idea signified by the word is not the same. The use of those terms is called homonymous. It sounds the same because it's the same word, but it doesn't have the same meaning. In uh, an, another word for homonymous language is equivocation, equivocation. When you retain the words, but the ideas signified by those words are not the same. This is one of the great causes of confusion in modern learning because many of the words of ancient philosophy and Christian history are retained in modern academic circles, but the meanings have changed. And that leads a lot of people to think that they know things they don't because they're using the same words, but they don't understand that the ideas signified by those words are not the same. Synonymous terms are terms which are used in exactly the same sense. They have the same sound or same name the word itself, and the idea that they signify is the same. And paronymous terms are terms that are similar. They're similar words, but they're not the same word, and they therefore also do not signify the same idea. An example of paronymous terms would be a word used in different cases in Latin or Greek, or a derivative, a word that's derived from another word, looks similar to it, like happy and happiness, but they're not the same word when we consider the work of demonstration. So, the second set of elements that Euclid establishes are definitions, and in those definitions, he establishes at the beginning of the investigation the terms that we're going to use, and he provides every term with a specific definition. And we're to study the definitions and agree to use those words in the senses provided every time we use those words in the investigation of geometry. 
That's the second kind of element, definitions. The third kind of element Euclid provides are The third kind of element that Euclid provides are called postulates. What postulates are, are actions that are granted for the investigation, actions that may be taken, which are simple to understand and require no demonstration. So, for example, if we have two points we can grant the postulate that a straight line may be drawn to connect those two points. And we accept that because of the definition of points and the definition of a straight line. If we connect two points with a straight line, it's understood that the definitions of those terms are the same. And because we can comprehend that action with no need for proof, we can grant that postulate as something certain, and we can use it in our investigation. So, at the outset of this investigation, Euclid shows us that we have these three types of elements, and now we set out to begin the investigation. What we have then are a a series of propositions. And propositions are basically demonstrations where something is proposed, some assertion is proposed based on the content of the elements, and then that proposition is demonstrated. It could be a problem or a theorem. A problem is something that needs to be done. A theorem is some assertion that needs to be demonstrated. And the point of this is this. The entire art of geometry proceeds step by step from the elements by reasoning with absolute certainty, proposition by proposition by proposition, from beginning to end. Every single assertion made in the art of geometry is absolutely certain and demonstrated in the study of the elements. That's true science, true philosophy. And that's the systematic and certain knowledge that was sought by the ancient philosophers. What St. Thomas does in the Summa Theologica is set out to investigate the question of divine revelation, to know all that can be known about God. And he does so following this same demonstrative method. Now, he doesn't follow the exact form that Euclid used. It's not as explicit as Euclid's method. But it's the same method as we see the progression made from the very first question in the Summa Theologica and then step by step through the entire investigation. Here's proof that this is how St. Thomas went about this investigation and, and the purpose of the Summa Theologica. As we read through the Summa, we will see that every time St. Thomas argues some new point. He refers back to previously demonstrated points, just as Euclid does in the propositions in geometry. The entire system of scholastic theology is organized from simple to complex. Every question of the Summa follows the questions that have previously been demonstrated. And so any time that St. Thomas refers for proof, he doesn't say, oh, go ahead 
to chapter 50, and in that chapter, I talk about this. Go ahead, go forward, and refer to that chapter. That's how a modern textbook might work, but that's not how the Summa Theologica works. Anytime St. Thomas needs proof, he points back to questions and articles in which he has already demonstrated the truths that he's going to reason from to establish the next conclusion because he's following and using the demonstrative method to establish the science of scholastic theology. Now, this is why two things are important to be understood. First of all, the Summa is not a reference book. It's not a book that you begin to use by flipping around and looking up topics because you will not understand the demonstrations or proofs of the teachings if you haven't studied what has been proven before. It's like picking up geometry and saying, I'm going to start at Proposition 36. No, you're not. And if you do that, not only are you faking the study, but you are not gaining the certainty that is the whole point of the study. So the Summa is not to be used as a reference book. Many people who fake an interest in theology will simply search the Summa online or look up a topic and read what St. Thomas says, and then, not having studied all of the previous demonstrations, will just read into the words of the Summa their own ideas rather than the ideas that have been established by St. Thomas in previous arguments. And so this is just the practice of equivocation which leads to all of the confusion and endless wrangling in modern academics. So first, as I said before, the Summa is not a reference book. However, after you've studied the whole Summa and understand the demonstrations, and have worked from the beginning to the end, then you can use the Summa as a reference book, but not before. Secondly, this proves that we're to study the Summa from beginning to end, just as we would study geometry from beginning to end. Imagine how ridiculous it is for St. Thomas to refer back to previous demonstrations to a reader who didn't study those previous demonstrations. That's not how St. Thomas intends the book to be used. And this is why the Summa is treated as if it's some kind of difficult, confusing study. Because people pick it up as some kind of anthology in a college course, skip around all over the place because they're told, oh, we're just going to survey the teachings of St. Thomas. We're just going to skip around maybe We'll learn about St. Thomas in a, you know, a 50-page little paperback. We'll, we'll learn what he taught. That undermines the whole point of the Summa Theologica, which is to establish systematic and certain knowledge of scholastic theology. And when Catholics allow themselves to fall for this simple survey of the Summa or summary of the teaching of St. Thomas Aquinas, they allow themselves to be deceived by letting someone appear to show that their teaching is coming from St. Thomas when what they're doing actually is reading their teaching back into the words of St. Thomas and pretending without any proof that that's what St. Thomas taught and meant in the Summa. You cannot study like that. The whole point of the Summa, the whole point of St. Thomas's work, if you're actually interested in St. Thomas and the truth that he labors to establish and teach in the Summa, if you're actually interested in that, you have to study it in the way that he taught it and wrote it. Because he wants to lead you to an absolutely certain knowledge of theology, 
where every single point, every single term is clearly established, every single assertion is first demonstrated before moving on to the next assertion. And so how to study the Summa Theologica? You start with the very first question in the very first part of the Summa, and you study that first question for mastery just as if you were studying the first proposition in Euclid's Elements. Now, this is one of the reasons why, in the ancient world, Plato said that he would not admit anyone into his academy, his philosophical school, who had not first learned the art of geometry. The reason why is because in geometry, the art of reasoning is so simply and visibly seen and understood and followed that the student gains a certain level or standard of certainty that changes his mind forever. When you've studied geometry, classical geometry, not modern chaos geometry for the sake of credits or diplomas, but the real art of geometry, and you see no assertion admitted that isn't first demonstrated or that isn't derived from previously demonstrated statements. When you go from that learning and turn around and begin reading other people's books, listening to people talk, it's hard to, it's hard to believe how chaotic and uncertain human thinking and teaching is because you become accustomed to the standard of exactness and certainty in Euclid's elements and in the art of geometry. The same thing is going to be true for the study of the Summa Theologica. It would be very good for you to first study the art of geometry, to see clearly the demonstrative method And then, with that standard of certainty established in your mind, to come to the Summa Theologica and see that St. Thomas, through what is almost miraculous, does the same thing for the entire science of theology based on divine revelation. So we begin with question one. And the first question St. Thomas asks are the, the necessary first questions. What are we studying? What is the subject that we're about to investigate? And he takes time to establish exactly what the subject is and how we're going to pursue the investigation. Most Catholics who claim to know the Summa and have studied the Summa don't even understand the content of the very first question in the Summa Theologica, because it's kind of boring. You don't get to the juicy stuff. You don't get to talk about all of the political topics and the the terms that are in the political debates, or the juicy questions like angels and demons and, and different virtues and vices to try to talk about morals. They don't study the very first question in which... St. Thomas introduces the whole investigation. So, we begin with the first question, and we study the first question for mastery. We have to understand each part of the first question, or article, where St. Thomas breaks down the first subject of investigation into ten different articles, or questions that need to be answered in order to answer and understand the first subject, we have to study the question that's asked, the exact question, which is a certain kind of question. It's a controversial or dialectical question, meaning that the question is asked, which has only two possible answers, sort of a yes or no question, usually introduced by the word whether or which of two That's the idea. That's a dialectical question. There can only be two possible answers. 
And then we have to pick one of those two answers, demonstrate the truth of that answer, and refute attempts to prove the contrary or the other answer to that question. And so what St. Thomas will do is he'll propose the question for the article, and then he'll say, here are a few, um, a few arguments for one of the possible answers to the question, but on the contrary, here's a reason based on some authoritative source or something that we, that we know is certain that, that sheds doubt on that answer. And then I respond, he says, with his positive demonstration for the answer that he believes is correct. He demonstrates his answer, and then he returns to the arguments made for the other possible answer, and he, uh, and he refutes each of them. And that's the method that he uses. So every single subject in a logical order from beginning to end, hundreds and hundreds of questions are arranged in logical order through the investigation of theology. And in every question, he breaks it down into necessary articles that have to be solved first, dialectical questions that need to be answered first. The answer to every one of those dialectical questions he provides a demonstration for, and his demonstrations are either absolutely certain and truly demonstrative, meaning that he argues from sources that are absolutely certain, like the authority of sacred scripture or the authority of the magisterium of the church. And where he can't do that, where he can't provide a demonstrative argument for a point, he then argues from the most probable sources. And this is where he will quote the church fathers, Aristotle, and other sources that he takes for granted, anyone reading the Summa Theologica will already accept as authoritative. The authority of those sources, however, is probable. And therefore, we have two different kinds of reasoning in the Summa. We have demonstrative reasoning, where arguments are made from absolutely certain sources, sources of divine revelation, for example. And then we have dialectical arguments which are based on the audience granting the authority of a certain source. But the, the nature of those arguments is probable. And that's the difference between demonstrative and dialectical reasoning and proof. So we could say that not everything St. Thomas argues in the Summa is absolutely certain. But everything that St. Thomas argues in the Summa Theologica, is at least probable. At least probable. And when we consider a probable argument, we then have to look at the objections to the, to the other answer, and we'll often find that while St. Thomas may not be able to demonstrate positively the truth of his answer, he can demonstrate the impossibility of the other answer, and that is essentially a demonstration of his answer to the question itself. If a question has only two possible answers, and we're not able to demonstrate with absolute certainty the truth of our answer, but can demonstrate the impossibility of the other answer, we have indirectly demonstrated our answer to the question. And this is what St. Thomas does one step at a time from the simplest point in the pursuit of the science of scholastic theology all the way to the very end. So how to study the Summa? There's a lot to understand, but what I want you to see is the confusion that surrounds the Summa is caused by modern academics. It's not in the Summa itself. In fact, the Summa is infinitely more simple and easy to study and master and comprehend and enjoy than any modern 
college teaching or modern book or modern author because of the demonstrative method and the order of the investigation itself. Now, in the Classical Liberal Arts Academy, we offer the study of the Summa Theologica in four separate courses, Summa Theologica 1, 2, 3, and 4. It may be helpful for you to study the Summa in the Classical Liberal Arts Academy because we teach it and lead students through it and assess it according to the way it's intended by St. Thomas to be studied. And you may find the work that we've done to organize the study to be helpful, uh, to master the work and enjoy the use of it. We have simple assessments for each question that are provided that, that, that lead the student to understand how to, how to approach each point in the Summa, how to study it, how to meditate on it, and how to apply it and use it in other areas of study. So if you'd like to study and follow the method that I've explained in this talk, I invite you to study it with us in the Classical Liberal Arts Academy. Um, because the text itself is in the public domain, we offer free access to it on our site, so you don't need to pay anything just to access the lessons and study. But if you'd like to, to go further and be able to complete the assignments that we provide for the lessons and submit them and have them reviewed and graded with some feedback and uh, live support and things like that, you just like to chat about some of the things you read and would like some companionship in your study, you should go ahead and enroll and you'd gain the benefit of all of those academic services. So all of that's available in the Classical Liberal Arts Academy, and that's what we do. That's what we do. And beginning this summer, I'm going to offer live classes where I walk through the Summa and simply discuss uh, the topics that come up in our study of the Summa one by one. There's no need to formally enroll in the course. You can participate in individual live classes. Every live class will be intended to be a standalone class that offers some benefit uh, to those who participate, but um, if you'd like to study the Summa Theologica and study it in the right way, the simple way, the way that St. Thomas intended for it to be studied, rather than in some artificial survey course or through some, some self-published paperback book that, that seeks to summarize it as if there's any value in having the Summa summarized, that makes, makes no sense, but if you'd like to actually study the Summa um, pursue the knowledge of the Summa rather than some temporal reward or token for having, you know, become familiar with some part of the Summa. You actually want to study the Summa for the purpose it was written. Um, I invite you to do so with us in the Classical Liberal Arts Academy. So I hope that's a helpful overview of this question, how to study the Summa Theologica. Um, it's an hour and 13 minutes already, so I'm going to stop talking. If there are other questions or issues that arise in your mind as, as you listen to this talk, please share them, comment on the video or, or, uh, or on the podcast page on the Academy website, and I'll take up those other questions and topics, and we'll continue the discussion. If you post on the YouTube video channel and add questions, I'll chat with you there. If you'd like to talk privately, you can email me at wcm at classicalliberalarts.com or catch me anytime on live chat on the Academy website. I hope that's helpful. God bless your studies.